I am Brian Banks. I'm kind of a weird guy. I experience borderline social anxiety, I'm about as athletic as a potato, and I'm not interested in drinking, athletics, or other male bonding activities. I'm decent-looking and slender, despite the fact that I never exercise, but my most distinguishing feature is my intelligence. Actually, I am really intelligent, unlike many other intelligent people. I am also perceptive. Despite my borderline social anxiety disorder and the fact that I skipped a grade in elementary school due to my neighborhood and the schools I attended, I was not behind in terms of sex education. I resided in a lower-middle-class neighborhood. I'm not sure if it was due of that, but there were a lot of sexually active women my age. I lived at home during college because one of the world's top five engineering universities was only a ten-minute commute away in exchange for assisting sexually active females in my neighborhood with their homework, taking take-home tests for them, or tutoring them in a variety of subjects both in high school and when they attended community colleges. I got tutored by myself. I was tutored in sex. I was nearly always sexually satisfied. Between the ages of 18 and 21, more than half of the females I tutored and those who tutored me appeared to be really pleased with my sexual abilities. I was the recipient of so much teaching because I soon established a reputation for being patient, discreet, and intelligent. I was able to connect with my female friends on an intellectual level, so they could readily understand the issues I assisted them with. I was always nice and kind to them during sex, and I never informed anybody else that I had sex with any of them, although I'm sure they informed each other that I had sex with 11 different women during this time, the majority of whom I had more than once. Although I never had a relationship with any of them, it was a rigid, albeit highly desirable, exchange of information for Kitty. Not always, Kitty. There was just one woman. She usually addressed me by her street name, Jezebel, rather than her real name. During this moment, I wasn't gentle. However, this was not because I was attempting to be polite to her. Jezebel is my age. She is a huge woman, as tall as I am, and probably weighed five or ten pounds more than I did at the time. Although she wasn't overweight, the most of her extra weight was in her upper body and powerful thighs, while her face was ordinary. Everyone who knew her, including me, believed she had one of the most Aphrodite-like bodies possible. Any man who wasn't enthralled by petite women with little jugs was considered Jezebel's body. Consummate Jezebel was very sexually active since she enjoyed sex, and could get pretty much any male to screw her. She was very athletic, playing softball and basketball for several weeks. While not extremely scholarly, she was not stupid, and had more ambition than the majority of our neighbors. Her main objective was to own an adult studio or website. I tutored her primarily in math and business, which would help her achieve her goal. Jezebel informed me, and I believed her, that I was the only guy she let screw her bareback because she was certain that I did not have STDs, no matter how hard I tried. She appeared to like it, but whether she was faking an orgasm or not, she always let out a primal scream and told me later that it was fantastic. Jezebel was the only one of my female acquaintances who ever took advantage of me without first providing her with some intellectual service. Six times. I recall exactly how many, since they left an everlasting mark on my socially inept mind. She simply called me at night and asked if I needed some wonderful sex. When I arrived up at her place in answer to her call, she delivered big time. I never fell in love with Jezebel, but I did like her and would have done everything for her even if she hadn't screwed me over. During my senior year of college, I created a sophisticated encrypted proximity detector that was easily programmed. It is similar to the EZ Pass system used on many toll highways in the United States, but it is designed exclusively for secure systems. Corporations with proprietary systems have implemented a variety of my detectors. The military includes several government agencies, both state and federal. To patent my own innovations, I needed to obtain a security clearance. As a result of my ideas, I received a large sum of money in patent royalties and established two firms to sell the items to various markets and study new products. Because I lack administrative skills and am just interested in inventing and engineering items, I had my solicitors create a labyrinth of shell and holding corporations that held my two running firms, and I hired individuals to run them. I held all of the shares in the ultimate holding company, but finding that out would need someone to be extremely educated and spend days searching. 
I never utilized my network of companies to avoid paying taxes, but some were located offshore to make it more difficult for anyone seeking for ownership to identify me. Only the CEOs and CFOs of my two running firms knew that I was the ultimate boss. To everyone else, I was just the salaried leader of one of the operating firm's new product engineering departments. By the age of 24, I had established all of the mechanisms described above and was searching for a long-term connection with the female. Things were difficult for me because I had borderline social anxiety and was no longer selling my brain power for sex. But at the age of 26, I finally met someone I was smitten with and who was interested in me after trying out a variety of online dating services and social groups. Allison was arguably the most attractive lady who had ever expressed genuine romantic interest in me. She had a stunning face and a really nice figure, despite the fact that we had a rather typical courting. Looking back, I see that it was more superficial than most. I believe I was so taken by her appearance and especially those amazing jerks that I ignored everything else. Some characteristics that many people consider important in a spouse. Throughout our relationship, however, I noticed her complete lack of interest in my profession. She never inquired about it, appeared bored, and pretended a complete lack of understanding. If I ever brought up my work, I was completely uninterested. Allison's lack of interest in my profession turned out to be an advantage in a prenuptial agreement. Gail, one of the attorneys who assisted me in establishing my corporations and whom I truly respected, insisted on a prenuptial agreement. In fact, when I was debating a prenup, after asking Allison to marry me and she accepted, Gail threatened to fire me if I didn't provide Allison with one. Gail prepared a short and straightforward prenuptial agreement. It simply said that the only thing free from communal property was any stock, interest, or royalty associated with any firm or patent that either of us possessed. More than 10% as of the date of marriage or acquired throughout the marriage. Allison had her father evaluate it and then sign it without even asking me about it. Sex with Allison was always enjoyable. I'd been married to Allison for approximately two and a half years, and we already had our first kid, a lovely little girl named Amber. When I ran into Jezebel on the street during a fast solo trip to my parents' house, I offered to buy them a new house in a nicer neighborhood. But they lived a humble life and had many friends in the area, so they declined. Jezebel looked great. She hadn't gained a pound since my last visit and she was dressed nicer than I'd ever seen her before. We went for a cup of coffee, and she informed me about her latest enterprise while I told her the same story about being a salaried employee. Jezebel was attempting to launch a pornographic website but was experiencing financial difficulties. I inquired about it and discovered that she only needed $25,000 more to get things working the way she wanted. I told Jezebel to meet me again in one week at the same coffee place an hour, and I might be able to introduce her to an investor. She was overjoyed and gave me a huge embrace and a kiss on the cheek as I left. I thought about it for a week. $25,000 was a blip on the screen to me, and despite the doubtful nature of the business, she was determined. I still felt a tender spot for her. A week after our first encounter, we met again, and she looked much better than before. She was dressed more revealingly, revealing that she still had the same superb figure that I had the pleasure of porking while I was in college, and she was in community college, but her face and hair looked better than they had ever before. The coffee had just been placed in front of us. I handed her an envelope containing $25,000 cash. Jezebel was overwhelmed. She actually started crying, which I would never have imagined from someone with such a tough demeanor. Jezebel offered to give me an ownership stake in the website. I gently rejected, explaining that I only wanted this as a present and did not want any ownership involvement. She stroked her palm against my thigh and offered to screw me better than at any other moment in my life using her body and motivation. I believe she would have kept her promise, but I gently rejected, explaining that I loved my wife. Your wife is a lucky witch, Jezebel murmured through tears as we parted ways. If there is anything I can ever do for you, only ask and it will be done. She stated it with utmost seriousness. Become a huge success. I replied with a wide smile and gave her a tight hawk. I was a little distressed as I held her, but I let go as soon as I felt something. She was kind enough to say nothing about it. Allison and I have two more children. 
Whitney is a second girl. No, I did not name her after Jezebel, but I immediately agreed when my wife offered the name. Next came Jerry, a boy. Having sex with Allison was always enjoyable. Over time, I realized she was actually quite superficial and materialistic. She had other nice traits, though, and I adored her. She was the only woman I had ever loved, and more importantly, she had given me three great children. Amber, 12, at the most significant stage in our story, possessed her mother's beauty as well as the best features of Allison and my personalities. She was also as smart as I was, testing at the genius level, but far more social. Whitney, 10, was also a gorgeous girl. But unfortunately for her, she inherited some of my features, which, while not unattractive, were not in the same league as Allison or Amber's. Whitney, on the other hand, was the most compassionate, loving, and empathic person I'd ever met, and her very presence could brighten up any room. She was also not hiding when the brains were passed out. Jerry, eight, was just a fun-loving little boy. I'm not sure where he obtained it. Perhaps on Allison's side of the family, but he was a true jock. I became interested in baseball and basketball so that I could have intelligent conversations with him about his favorite pastimes. He never had anything terrible to say about anyone. He looked to be in a pleasant mood all the time and got along well with both of his sisters, as well as with themselves. You would assume that with such amazing children, Allison would be an excellent mother. Unfortunately, this was not the case. Allison and I had major disagreements over how to raise our children. I am not sure what that was. Maybe it was just the green-eyed monster of jealousy. Allison had a bad relationship with Amber. She was excessively strict with Amber and made some nasty comments. I had multiple blow-ups with Allison in front of Amber because I couldn't handle it when she mistreated her. By the time Amber turned 12, she refused to go anywhere with her mother unless I accompanied her. Allison wanted to take the kids to a lake cottage her family owned for a week one summer while I was at work, which became a major issue. It took everything I had to persuade Amber to participate in a real conflict with Allison in order for her to be pleasant to Amber on the trip. Allison was better with Whitney and Jerry than Amber, although she still had her difficulties with them. Also, despite the fact that Allison was a stay-at-home parent, I believe I spent as much time with the kids as she did, as she was always attending one function or another. The time I spent with them was usually of higher quality. So, after 15 years of marriage, three wonderful children, and a wife that I adored and liked having sex with, despite the fact that our marriage was far from ideal, I was traveling home from the airport after a one-night business trip. It was approximately 1 p.m., and although though I had told Allison about my entire schedule based on my phone conversation to the family the night before, she had not, as usual, paid any attention to it, so I had no idea if she would be home to greet me or not. If she was, I was expecting for some afternoon pleasure in the form of sex before the kids returned home from school at around 330. I was at a stop sign about to turn right onto my street when a car I knew drove past. It was Roger Mayberry's signature red Corvette. The top was down, and he was visible in the driver's seat, fiddling with the radio dial while music blared from his bespoke speakers. Roger Mayberry was a top salesperson in one of my companies, focusing especially on military sales. He had as good an understanding of our technology as any non-engineer could be expected to have, and he, like nearly all of our employees, had a top-level security clearance, even higher than most because the military applications of our technology were more sensitive than any other. What is Roger doing here at this time of day? I stupidly asked myself, given that the street I reside on is a through street. I didn't even contemplate the possibility that he was at my house, which is about two blocks away. I was just wondering what business occasion may bring him to this end of town. Within a minute or two, I had parked into my driveway, entered into the home, and not seeing Allison on the first floor, walked up the pretentious winding staircase that Allison adored and required to reach the second level. My shoes on our marble hallway floor made a distinct clap-clap as I approached the open master bedroom door. When I was about ten feet from the door, I heard a sultry voice ask, Did you forget anything, ROG? Or have you decided to make another sperm deposit? In disbelief, I entered the master bedroom and discovered Allison, naked and laying on her back. When she peered up between her splayed knees and spotted me, her smile faded to worry, and she half yelled, Oh, Brian! 
I'm so sorry. Unfortunately, within a nanosecond, my mind had fully absorbed the scenario, and sensations of rage, contempt, worry, hatred, and terror were whizzing through my mind at breakneck speed. I'm sure I stood there paralyzed, mouth gaping, while all of the other emotions rumbling inside me merged into a single sense. A dreary, black, oppressive pall of despair fell over me. I recall stumbling backwards for a few steps before waking up in the hospital. A monitor appears to have notified the nursing station of my awakening, since a nurse ran into my room seconds after I opened the door. My eyes were followed about a minute later by a doctor. Mr. Banks, how are you feeling? Nancy innocently said, a cute middle-aged nurse with the name tag? As if my head were in a vice. We're overjoyed to see you awake so quickly, she exclaimed, gripping my wrist and peering at a monitor beside my bed at the same time. Why am I in the hospital and how did I get here? I asked as soon as the doctor walked in. Mr. Banks, my name is Dr. Petra and I'm a short, charming female Indian doctor. Please allow me to gaze into your eyes before I answer your questions. She continued with Nurse Nancy still holding my wrist, and Dr. Petra took some sort of light source out of her pocket, showing it back and forth and moving my eyelids and the skin surrounding my eyeballs with her soft yet firm hands for about two minutes. When Dr. Petra straightened up, the nurse released my wrist. They both grinned and Dr. Petra stated, Mr. Banks, you have a concussion. According to your wife, you tripped in your bedroom, fell backwards onto your hallway's marble floor, and smacked your head on the stone. You could have perished, but your vital signs are good, and your concussion is unlikely to have been as serious as we feared. The cloud of grief returned as I remembered what had caused my backward slip. My eyes widened as I moaned and barfed back. Fortunately, Nurse Nancy had rapid reactions in some form of receptacle, albeit not a barf bag was under my chin in an instant. Despite not having eaten lunch that day, I barfed up whatever was in my stomach, mostly bile. After my stomach was fully empty, I laid back Nancy, applied a cool compress to my head, and Dr. Petra performed another examination. When she had finished, she declared, I'm startled by your regurgitation. Mr. Banks, that could signal a more serious concussion than I had hoped, but there are no other indicators of it. Could my reflex reaction have been the result of remembering an emotional crisis that led to my fall? I inquired, already knowing the response. Yes, that is certainly feasible, Dr. Petra reflected, caressing her chin. Did you have such an emotional crisis? Yeah, that was my surly response. I did not react well emotionally when I saw another man having sex with my wife. I snorted. After a brief pause, I was really rather pleased of myself for not using offensive language in my soliloquy. Despite this, the surprised expressions on the faces of my medical attendants would suggest otherwise. By the way, I cynically continued before any of them could show pity or fall backwards. Where is my devoted bride? Well, she was here, but when are you going to pick up your children from school? Nancy said, regaining her calm. I looked at the clock. It was 3.28, so she was probably picking them up soon away. Have you eaten lately, doctor? Petra asked, her face still ashen. I said, not since about eight this morning. Your regurgitation was clearly emotional rather than the result of a concussion. She highly advised you to eat something before your wife returns with the children. You don't suppose I'll just throw up again when I see her? I inquired. No, I don't, Dr. Petra answered. As long as it is something harmless... Nurse Jenkins, could you kindly have the kitchen speed up a dish of porridge with cinnamon and raisins? No brown sugar, I said, turning to Nancy and attempting to be as friendly as possible. The oatmeal was brought in within five minutes. I immediately finished the bowl and felt slightly better. By the time Nancy returned to my room and announced, You have visitors, my three sweethearts had crowded in, each trying to be the first to reach me. Darlings, do not touch Daddy's head or neck. I giggled as I attempted to hold all three in my two arms. They were all speaking at the same moment, each more impassioned than the next. Despite my physical and emotional state, I had to laugh. A genuine laugh would certainly hurt, but a hearty chuckle was definitely required. I barely noticed Allison. I was preoccupied with talking to the kids. Amber had definitely been crying, but now that she knew I wasn't going to die, she was perking up, and the other two were all grins. Allison stood at the entrance, puzzled, as I talked to the kids. I avoided discussing my injury as much as possible, instead focusing the conversation on their activities. Yesterday, 
I was out of town. Allison interfered a few times today with questions or comments, but I simply ignored her and avoided eye contact. After about 15 minutes of amusement, I observed Nancy mention something to Allison. Allison said a minute later, Children, Daddy is still ailing and needs to get better, so we must leave. Kiss his hands goodbye, and we will see him again tomorrow. The kids slobbered over my palms before waving goodbye. Amber was definitely in a better place than when she first arrived, and Jerry appeared to be okay. But now you can get a good look at me on my hospital bed from a distance. Whitney was starting to cry and turned her head suddenly as she departed, clearly trying to hide her tears. Allison yelled out to the children after they had left. Meet Mommy at the elevator lobby. I'm going to talk to Daddy for a few minutes. Allison turned and approached me. I hadn't had time to properly organize my reaction, and I obviously didn't have the ability to change the alternatives that I had previously considered. So I just closed my eyes and listened. Brian. I am so sorry you had to see me like that. I didn't want you to find out. I apologize. I'm not the wife you deserve. I'm really hoping that when you get well we can talk about this, she said, her voice tinged with both moaning and sobbing, but there was no genuine crying. When she received no reaction from me, she stated, Maybe you'll want to talk tomorrow. If you do, please phone me. Her final sentence was telling in itself. She clearly had no interest in visiting me in the hospital, I would have to approach her and have a conversation with her. Otherwise, she didn't show up. Dr. Petra returned around 20 minutes after Allison departed. After another examination, she stated, you don't appear too upset after speaking with your wife. I didn't speak with my wife, I deadpanned. However, while I am still very saddened by the loss of my prior life, I am confident that I will be able to channel my emotions into action. I will not throw up again. That's good she remarked, smiling. Doctor, how long do you suppose I'll have to stay here? I insist that you spend one more night after tonight, but if your checkup is satisfactory, you may depart. But you must restrict your activity for at least a week, and no going into your office for at least three, four days, I insist. She replied in as forceful a voice as a five-foot-tall female could muster. I promise. I chuckled before reaching out and grabbing her hand. That is, I guarantee you will not tell my wife that you will release me in the morning on Friday. Obviously, I cannot expect you to lie to her, but if she is concerned enough to inquire, may you indicate that I will have to stay till Saturday? I believe I can do that, doctor. Petra laughed. As long as I don't have to outright lie in response to a straight query, I will tell Nurse Jenkins the same thing. I ate a full dinner, called my parents, who, for obvious reasons, Allison had not contacted, went to my assistant's house and requested a legal pad and pin. That night, I was too tired to write down what I needed to accomplish, but I'd be ready to outline my strategy the next morning. Allison showed up with the kids again about 350 on Thursday afternoon. As I had predicted, she did not bother to come see me earlier in the day, and I had no intention of calling her. Although Nancy stated that she had called the nursing station once to inquire about my well-being, by the time the kids arrived on Thursday... I felt considerably better. That wasn't only because I was recuperating, I had a very productive day. I had numerous individuals from my office visit me, as well as my attorney, Gail, who had completed my prenuptial agreement, and my parents joined me for lunch. Nothing I performed was related to my research into proximity sensors. However, it was all about planning my life outside of work. After spending a great half hour with the kids, as I had directed Nancy earlier in the day, she came in and told me I needed to rest. Allison did the same thing as the first day, except this time I didn't close my eyes when she spoke to me. Darling, you never phoned me to come and discuss our predicament, she murmured softly. I guess I wasn't important enough for you to check if I was alive or dead unless I phoned, I replied back, attempting to reduce the sarcasm in my reply but probably failing. That is not fair, sweetheart, she quietly responded. I didn't want to bother you if you weren't willing to discuss. I'll probably want to talk this weekend, darling, I replied snarkily once they released me. I apologize again, Brian. I truly hope we can get past this, she whispered. Then she took my hand and kissed it. I had no reaction whatsoever. Why should she just say something as she exited with a modest wave? Of course, it wasn't lost on me that she never stated she loved me or that she was going to quit her romance with Roger Mayberry, and the only sign of genuine regret I could detect 
was that she had been discovered. The remaining 10% of my idea that I hadn't polished would be simple to come up with. Now, right before the visiting hours were over. Allison's father and mother arrived to visit me. I was astonished until they casually mentioned the reason for their visit. Allison apparently did not think it would be appropriate for her to threaten me with the loss of the children if we divorced. So she asked her parents to do it. Allison has told us about her big error, her mother stated as she held my hand. Oh, seriously? What is that? I sarcastically inquired after a lengthy wait. Her mother responded, You know it very well. It's what caused your accident. I simply hope you can forgive her. Brian, you're a wonderful person and a caring father, and I know it would break your heart not to be with your children every day. Ruth, you are quite correct, I answered in a melancholy voice. Being melancholy was only an act. The most critical part of my plan was to obtain sole custody of the children. After a few more minutes of perfunctory talk, after Allison's parents had conveyed the message that I was confident their daughter needed them to deliver, they removed any ambiguity about what I was supposed to do. Dr. Petra examined me again on Friday morning before signing my release papers. Remember to take it easy for at least a week, she advised. Scout's honor, I said, giving my version of the Boy Scout salute. I'm not sure how close I came, having never been a Boy Scout, but she did giggle. I thanked Nancy and offered her a dollar five hundred cash tip, which she had to decline, so I gave her a careful hug instead and left with my assistant Jack around 10 a.m. Exacting revenge on Roger Mayberry would be simple. I could just fire him, but that would not suffice as retribution. What I needed to do was wreck his career. What kind of punishment would you face if you recently found a job in a related sector for nearly the same salary? I needed to ensure that he lost his security clearance. That would make it impossible for him to find a career with anywhere approaching the pay or reputation that he currently has. After consulting with Gail and a divorce specialist she recommended, as well as obtaining Roger's bank account information from payroll because his paychecks were direct deposited, the next step was to see Jezebel, who would assist me in obtaining sole custody of my children. My assistant took me to Jezebel's office, but I asked him to wait in the car, even though Jack would be fully aware of all my preparations. I needed to speak to Jezebel alone. I had called ahead, but Jezebel still seemed surprised and excited to see me. So there. Jezebel. I giggled as she hurriedly moved her large, attractive body toward me. I have a concussion and cannot give you the big embrace I would like. Can we simply kiss each other's hands, you scum sucker? She giggled. You probably got the concussion, so I couldn't marry you. We exchanged hand kisses, a rather poor greeting, but it would have to suffice. Jezebel looked great. She was dressed tastefully but professionally, and she didn't appear to have gained any weight since she was 18. She was still the quintessential sexy woman. Come into my office, she demanded, clutching my arm. I expressed my excitement at seeing Jezebel again. I got straight to the point. I need your help, Jezebel, I murmured, my despair returning. She said, anything, Brian, while clutching my hand. You have no clue how much I want to help you. Whatever it is, you helped me realize my dream. So long as I don't have to kill anyone, I'm all for that comment. And her wide smile as she delivered it lifted my spirits more than I could have imagined. Okay, you've asked for it. I chuckled. I didn't leave out any details about what had happened or the part of my reaction that I needed her assistance with. This included telling her how important my children were to me, and I even showed her images of them. When she learned that my middle child's name was Whitney, she fell silent. You named her Whitney? She gasped. I knew what she was thinking, and there was no explanation. Why shouldn't I gild the lily given the current circumstances? Yes, named after a favorite individual from my pre-marriage life. I responded with a huge smile. She choked up began to cry and murmured in between sobs, You're a scum sucker. The only two times I've sobbed in the last ten years were because of you. I grinned and squeezed her hand. Hey, the tears of delight are enormous. I could use them right now. How can I aid with their delivery? She inquired, brushing away tears. I need you to post pornography starring my wife on your website and make money to her bank account for it. We had a thorough discussion about the situation after she had recovered from her first shock. She offered many solid recommendations, including one stunning one. You must ensure that this is never traced back to you, 
as someone may discover that you and I had a previous association, she warned. Is that how you refer to it in association? I gave a harsh laugh. She giggled. It is my turn to tutor you. I have a friend who can do this on a far more popular pay porn website than mine. No questions were asked. All you have to do is root money to him. That will be deposited into your wife's bank account. Let me call him right now. Jezebel had everything planned out in four minutes over the phone with her friend. She told me what format the porn films should be in and that whatever cash I provided her, she would pay to her buddy in the same amount and the money would be deposited in Allison's account. Furthermore, my friend will require your wife's signature on a document that includes a release. Can you fool her or forge it properly? I can, I said. She said, I will email it to you today. Wait till tomorrow. I will create a new email account at the library just for that purpose and send you an email with it, once she signs. I grinned. I was on a natural high as I prepared to leave Jezebel's office. When I departed, I risked pain by giving her a delicate kiss on the lips. Fortunately, shortly after we married, my wife insisted on having a credit card and a bank account in her name solely. I never bothered to check them before, but I will now. I would have no trouble obtaining the numbers from paperwork she left laying around in the den at home. I had a lot going for me, which influenced my retribution. Bank account numbers for both Roger and Allison, as well as Allison's credit card information. I had enough of my own money to finance everything I desired, and Jezebel's assistance. Also, my assistant Jack was entirely faithful, and I could count on him to accomplish anything. I need to say something about Jack. He's my assistant, not my secretary. He is my highest paid employee, aside from the CEOs and CFOs of my businesses. Although he has an engineering degree and excels at crunching statistics and making technical improvements to my wacky plans, he is also prepared to do everything to assist. That is why he picked me up from the hospital and waited for me at Jezebel's. One more thing. He was a Division I football player in college, starting as a middle linebacker his senior year. He's 6'2 two inches and 245 pounds of practically pure muscle. He has problems finding suit coats that do not have arms that he can take out. My revenge could go badly, but I had meticulously prepared and had to remain optimistic. I arrived at my house after Jack had dropped me off at my car. I didn't go inside to check if Allison was home. I ate lunch and then called Allison's cell phone. Hello, sweetheart. I'm really delighted you phoned. Do you want me to come visit you? Was it her sing-song greeting, given that my mobile number was clearly displayed on her caller ID? That will not be necessary, I answered coldly. I was released early, so I'll go pick up the kids and take them for milkshakes. We'll be home around 530. Oh, dear. I must prepare a lovely homecoming dinner for you, she gushed, trying to sound optimistic. Do not ruin their appetites. I shut her off. Thank you for your parenting advice, I replied sarcastically. See you at 530. The kids were thrilled to see me. They inquired about my health and were very excited about their activities. They were even more excited when I informed them we were going to have milkshakes from the neighborhood malt shop, something that made them all giggle. After all, four of us were well into our shakes. I opened up to them. I want you to know, kids, that certain things will change in the future, and it is not your fault. I began in a low-key, matter-of-fact tone, which did not mislead Amber at all. She knew exactly what I was going to say. She extrapolated from it. If you and Mom split, I will live with you. She blurted out, Are you two getting divorced? When he asked, Let us not get ahead of ourselves here, I remarked, attempting to soothe everyone, particularly Whitney, who had suddenly had a hangdog expression. Mom and I are having some troubles, and I'm not sure how it will turn out. However, I want you to know that no matter what, we both love you with all of our hearts, and you three wonderful animals are in no way to blame for our problems. Amber once again surprised me. You love us wholeheartedly, but does Mom have one? Mommy loves us, Jerry spoke up. Don't be too sure, Squirt, Amber shot back, attempting to as diplomatic as possible. I laid my palm over one of the ambers. Honey, I know Mom adores every one of you. Sometimes she just doesn't know how to express it. Let us not think poorly of her, and let's hope that everything works out. Whitney was silently sniffling, but Jerry and Amber appeared to snap out of it, especially when Jerry inquired with eight-year-old sincerity. Will you come to my Little League game tomorrow at noon? That it is against the Ravens and I am going to pitch. I would not miss that for the world, son. 
I chuckled. What events do you gals have planned for Saturday? I inquired in the cheeriest voice possible. I missed my usual Thursday update because of my three-day hospital stay. We came home around 520. All three children seemed upbeat. Throughout Allison's greeting, I made sure that at least one youngster was always between us, because I did not want any physical touch with her. After the children went to bed that night, I went to the guest room. Don't you want to talk? Allison asked. I have a searing headache from my concussion, and all I need to do is take my painkillers and sleep. It will most likely be erratic, and I do not want to bother you. I responded by gulping down two Tylenol tablets that I passed off as prescription pain relievers and closing the door. Allison said, I'm available to talk any time, as the guest room door closed on her. I was able to avoid any meaningful talk or intimacy with Allison on Saturday and Sunday, allowing me to begin putting my plan into action. The first actions were simple, involving Allison's credit card. On Saturday morning, I bought two compact high-tech video cameras and motion detectors for expedited delivery to my residence on Monday. At the library, I printed the pawn contract that Jezebel had emailed to the account I had set up for that reason, then promptly deleted it. I also printed new beneficiary and health insurance paperwork from my company's database. Attach the pawn contract as the second-to-last item in the stack, then place tabs where Allison was supposed to sign each one. I knew Allison would be agreeable throughout the weekend, but it wouldn't last very long. On Sunday, I handed her the documents and explained that they were work-related health, disability, and life insurance forms that needed to be updated, and that she and the children were co-beneficiaries on all of my policies. I left the paperwork with her and told her to peruse them whenever she wanted. I knew she wouldn't read them all, but she'd skim the first one or two if her name appeared on the first two. As a beneficiary, she grinned, clearly understanding that despite my aloofness, I had no intention of divorcing her. Just a few minutes after I handed her the documents, she returned them to me with a wide grin. All signed, dear. She signed them as she handed them to me while I began a card game with Whitney and Jerry. Thank you. I murmured, and flipped the paperwork into my open briefcase as casually as I could before dealing the cards. I also called the CEO of the company I controlled where Roger Mayberry worked and asked him to contact the federal agency in charge of our security clearances to arrange security checks for the five personnel in Mayberry's section. Because of the sensitive nature of our job, we are subject to spot security checks, much as other firms are subject to spot drug testing. So none of the employees would be aware that the review was begun by their company rather than the government. Allison insisted on talking on Monday morning after the children had departed for school. Brian, we cannot ignore what happened. If we do, it will eat away at you and end our relationship. She started out sitting across the kitchen table from me. I wanted to say what the relationship was, but I resisted. Instead, I told Allison... My head is still spinning and I have yet to come to terms with what I saw. I need to get my head on right before we can have a truly meaningful talk. I'm not going to do anything rash. Okay, dear, she said after a brief delay. Obviously satisfied, if not pleased. I hope you feel better soon, though. I truly want to show you how much I care about you. My medications and I miss you. I grinned, almost killing myself, and then continued. I miss them, too. I need to travel to the country club for a social committee meeting in about a half hour and return around two so I can pick up the kids from school. Will you be okay without me? She responded to her query. I wanted to respond. I'll find out soon, but I controlled myself. Have a great time. I'll be fine, I said. She was making things too easy. The cameras arrived about a half hour after she left, by courier. When I called Jack, he came over and sat between us. In less than an hour, we had the cameras put on off switches and motion detectors in the master bedroom. To avoid leaving fingerprints or DNA, we handled all of the equipment while wearing latex gloves. We then had to direct the feeds to Allison's computer. While I am proficient with computers, Jack is incredibly smart. All we need to do is locate her password, and it'll take me ten minutes to connect the cameras to her PC. I have the best password cracking program on my laptop. I will connect mine to hers and go to work, Jack revealed while still wearing latex gloves. After starting the software, Jack began to explain what we could do while it ran, but was interrupted by a beep. 
What is that? I inquired. Is it malfunctioning? I do not think so. Holy crap, it's already cracked. He laughed. How is this possible? I asked. The software first tests the 1,000 most popular passwords before using the cracking algorithms. Her password is Princess, which is the 28th most frequent password according to the software. That makes sense. I chuckled. She never listened to what else I had to say about technology. Why would she have listened to me when I told her to change her password to arbitrary symbols, true to his word? Within five minutes, Jack had the cameras recording to a file with a generic name on Allison's computer. After another five minutes, he had it set up such that I could access the file from my office at any time and control the cameras and motion detectors remotely. I went into work on Tuesday since I was feeling well, and I turned on the cameras and motion detectors before leaving. I arranged for a $10,000 transfer from a shell corporation I owned in the Cayman Islands to Roger Mayberry's bank account. After that, I felt better emotionally and was making good physical progress in my recovery from a concussion. So I got some real work done once the kids went to bed. Tuesday night, Allison approached me. Why don't you come back to our bed tonight? If you could work today, your head had to be feeling better. It is not, I said, despite feeling virtually normal. On Wednesday and Thursday, I almost allowed myself to believe that Allison had understood how badly she had hurt me, loved me, and would even break up with Mayberry. Of course, that didn't stop me from turning on the cameras when I left the house or carrying out my plan, because I understood those ideas were fantasy, not reality. That was confirmed when I looked at the video from Thursday afternoon. My loving wife had a look of ecstasy on her face as she faced the camera and moaned while Mayberry was having sex with her. I could only tolerate a few minutes of it. While I was ecstatic that the video was all I needed to try to gain sole custody of the children. My shroud of grief lasted briefly. Friday morning, I submitted Allison's Thursday afternoon screw fest to the pay porn site for $5,000 cash delivered to Jezebel. And by Friday night, $5,000 had been wired from the porn site to Allison's bank account in the video that was available for all paying customers to watch. It was bad that they had to pixelate Mayberry's face since the website did not have a release from him, but I was quite delighted that the section of the website where the video was displayed was called. Three or four wives screw behind their husbands' backs in the marital bed. How appropriate. In the following two weeks, two additional movies were published to the porn site, another $5,000 was deposited into Allison's bank account, and another $10,000 was wired from another Cayman Islands business to Mayberry's bank account. I needed to bring the hammer down before Allison and Mayberry found out about the month's bank statements and asked what was going on. I did an excellent job of acting by starting to cry when she wanted me to screw her and said, Allison, I'm not ready for that yet. When I said that, she responded almost as if she were a genuine caring person. I understand, baby. Let me know when you are ready. The day after the third porn video was made accessible to the paying public, Mayberry's security evaluation was conducted. I'm not sure how it happened, but the reviewer possessed an unpixelated copy of one of the films depicting Mayberry defrauding Allison, as well as Mayberry's bank statement. Mayberry was the third person in his group to be interviewed that day, so I'm sure he had no idea that his was the most crucial, because the CEO would receive a copy of the lie detector findings as well as the questions and answers. I received a copy of the interview transcript. By the end of the day, Mayberry's interview. After Mayberry was connected up to the lie detector and the initial questions were answered, the reviewer nailed him. Mr. Mayberry, do you have any activities outside of work that someone could use to blackmail you about? No, I do not think so. Mayberry answered with a sharp movement of the lie detector needle. I would want to show you a video, Mr. Mayberry. The reviewer continued by pressing a few buttons on his iPad. Who is the woman you had sex with two weeks ago? Thursday? Mayberry's face appeared to be drained of color as he considered whether he should lie or reveal the truth, and which would be worse for his security clearance. I suppose he decided to come clean. Isn't Allison Banks married to one of your co-workers, Brian Banks? Brian Banks actually works for a connected company, even if his office is located in the same building as mine. Mayberry stammered, It's a big building. You never imagined that having an affair with a married co-worker might potentially lead to blackmail. Roger murmured, I never really thought about that. 
Have you had any payments from foreign entities since your last security clearance? Absolutely not, Roger said angrily. Let me show you this month's statement for your bank account. Mr. Mayberry, what are the deposits from two different Cayman Islands-based entities for? There was a prolonged pause. Mayberry responded hesitantly. I do not know. This is something I have never seen before. It must have been a mistake. One made by two different Cayman Island firms for which we have yet to identify ownership. The reviewer proceeded. Yes, someone is setting me up, Mayberry complained, clearly worried. Did someone falsify the video of you and Mrs. Banks? The reviewer said, with what I'm sure was sarcasm in his voice, despite the fact that he was meant to stay objective. After a few more questions, the interview was over. Mayberry said nothing when, after detaching the electrodes from the lie detector, the reviewer said, Mr. Mayberry, until you were told otherwise, you were not to have any contact with anyone related to confidential and secret information, nor were you to contact Mr. or Mrs. Banks or either of the two corporations that deposited money in your account. If you do, you will face prosecution. I felt great the night of Mayberry's interview. Allison was really nice to me and flirted with me. After dinner, we went to bed as soon as we were certain the kids were asleep. I knew it would be the last time I had close touch with Allison, laying side by side, snuggling in a voice almost as seductive as hers. Wow, was she ever a decent straight man? I giggled to myself before looking her in the eyes. Allison, I will never have sex with you. Who knows how many affairs you have aside from Mayberry's nasty? The expression on her face was priceless. After sputtering out, what the earth do you mean by becoming red and then blabbing nonsense? She stormed out of bed in one of the guest rooms. I dropped the kids off at school the next day. Allison gave me nothing but chilly stares. After the kids had left, I made a phone call and the doorbell rang 30 seconds later. This is for you, three or four. I chuckled. How could you talk to me like that? Are you a crazy? Allison lost her cool. I won't for very long. Three or four, I said, chuckling. Allison answered the door. The process server handed her the divorce papers. I only heard Mrs. Allison Banks. Yes, you have been served. In addition to the divorce papers, there were stills of her screwing Mayberry in the name of the pornographic payment website, along with a password that could be used to access it. You didn't believe I'd find out about you selling pornographic videos? You sleazy witch, I asked, as she stood bewildered beside the kitchen table. Have you ever looked at what you look like on a pornographic website? That's how you find out, I yelled as she held the paper with the pornographic site, web address, and password on it. My assistant brought it to my notice, and I couldn't believe it. It isn't enough that you disrespected me by creating a hole in our bed. Then you have to broadcast it and make money from it. I have no idea what's going on, she said, tears welling up in her eyes. I got up and said that I was taking the kids on a weekend getaway, Make sure to employ the greatest lawyer you can. I'm confident that your professional porn earnings will be beneficial because you'll need them. The same day, Mayberry was fired, escorted out of the building, and his security clearance was withdrawn. About an hour before I was supposed to leave to pick up the kids for the weekend, my secretary made a call over the intercom. Brian, there's a report that Roger Mayberry is in the parking lot chanting your name while inebriated. Should I call the police? No, Sherry. I giggled. Call Jack and ask him to come here straight away. This seemed too wonderful to be true. When Jack came, we walked to a window in our building to see where Mayberry was. It was the site of one of the best security camera evaluations. The manner he was wobbling back and forth indicated that he was intoxicated. We rapidly devised a plan. Jack went out one of the side doors and waited next to the building, just out of sight of the camera, while I bravely went out the front door. When Mayberry saw me, he screamed, Banks, are you screwing a hole? You are the one that got me fired and damaged my security clearance. I know it. I am going to kick your bum. I trotted, rather than rushed, to a location in camera view near where Jack was. I let Mayberry get close enough to hit me, but it was merely a glancing blow to my shoulder. I collapsed like if it were the most devastating punch in history. As Mayberry rose above me, ready to punch again, Jack appeared in front of the camera, grabbed Mayberry, and punched him once in the jaw with his forearm as if he were an opposing running back. 
Mayberry flew at least four feet backward. Unconscious, Jack approached me and pulled me up, and I appeared to be drowsy as I rested against the vehicle. Jack dialed 911. All of this occurred in full front of the security cameras, and the cops arrived within three minutes. Mayberry was handcuffed to the stretcher that the fire department ambulance transported him on, and one of the cops accompanied him to the hospital. I completed the appropriate paperwork to press charges for assault, then picked up the kids and drove to a beautiful mountain resort for the weekend. I informed the children at the end of the weekend that Allison and I were divorcing. Amber appeared happy. The other two were surprised and relaxed about it, remembering my promise to be as loving to them as possible. When we returned Sunday night, Allison was not quite as unpleasant as I had anticipated in preparation for a potential outburst from her. I had moved all of my most important possessions and much of my wardrobe to a temperature-controlled storage facility. I had no intention of leaving the house. However, after the kids informed her about our enjoyable weekend, she and I spoke. Her first words were, I know you set up this videoing thing, Brian, but I'm not sure how you did it, although in a more conciliatory tone than I would have expected. No apologies. No, that was an error. No, please forgive me. I asked, just blaming me for something that all the evidence shows I did not do. I responded, attempting to seem outraged in case she was recording our chat. Brian, I've been busy this weekend. I hired both an attorney and a computer specialist. Again, I'm not sure how you did it, but you really covered your tracks effectively, and it'll be difficult for me to overcome this unfit mother rap you're putting on me. I'm hoping, however, that we can reach an agreement regarding custody. Sure we can. Allison, you give me sole custody of the house so that the children do not have to relocate, and I will grant you liberal visitation. I'll also get you a house for you and Mayberry so you can get your rocks off. And have you heard that he's not only out of a job, but out of a career? I do not want to share a house with Roger. It was never about that. Yes, it was, she began to say. I cut her off fast. I don't want to hear that, Allison, I snapped. I recovered my calm and continued. You can hook up with anybody you want. I simply don't give a damn. I'm only making an offer after a pause and maybe a tear or two, she added. Look, I understand that you believe I'm a bad mother, but I am not. I adore the children and can't bear the thought of living apart from them. I also don't see how it would benefit either of us to fight it out in court. I know you'll smear me in every way conceivable, and I don't have the stomach for it. Neither of us wants the kids to know all of the specifics or watch the recordings. I agree that we don't want the kids to find out the details, I mused. What do you propose? I inquired, genuinely curious. My attorney proposes that we agree on a mediator. He believes a former family court judge would be ideal. I'll go with sole or joint custody and you can do the same. We will allow the mediator to review everything, including what the children's wants are, and they will comply with whatever he decides. That way, we can keep everything discreet and reach a resolution much faster, she explained. Actually, I was surprised she could be so rational. I believe she recognized I had a much stronger personality than she had given me credit for, since I'm sure she had several lengthy conversations with Roger Mayberry. I suggested that we hold a combined meeting with our attorneys early next week to work out the details. I simply have one exception to your proposal. Under no circumstances will I seek joint custody. That is overly demanding on the children, and I want exclusive custody. If the mediator mandates it, I will comply. But only in that scenario. I am not proposing it. I let Allison use the main bedroom while I slept in the guest room. I didn't tell her why, since I didn't want to increase her stress level. But now that everything was out, there was no way I could sleep. Where? Perhaps it screwed her. Tuesday, we had a joint meeting with our attorneys. We both told our attorneys to simply perform what we requested in a lawful manner. We didn't want them to haggle. We devised a contract that provided for a 50, 50 division of all marital assets, with the exception of what was exempted by the prenuptial agreement, which was 90% of our fortune. The name of the mediator, a former family court judge with an excellent reputation. When the hearing before him is scheduled, and the mediator's secret ruling is required, the amount of child support I would pay if Allison were granted sole or joint custody of any child, as well as the amount of maintenance I would pay Allison for two years or until she remarried, whichever came first. The restrictions on who she can associate with vary in any way. If the children were present, she felt insulted, 
but she stated that she no longer wanted to see him, so she agreed. Agreement not to speak with the children in order to influence what they would tell the mediator about how much Allison could pay at my expense for a new living space. Whether a house, condo, or apartment, if I got sole custody and she had to leave our house, and what the specific arrangements would be if we had joint custody, or what the visitation rights would be if either of us got sole custody of any child. It took all day to work out the specifics, but we finished. The possible mediator was contacted the next day. He promised to handle the lawsuit and his compensation, which would be 50 of 50 from our shared assets and not subject to the prenup. We even planned a briefing date two weeks in advance, followed by a hearing date many weeks later. I didn't make Allison put it in the contract, but we discussed it in private, and we both agreed that neither of us would bring anyone else into our house while we shared it, and that once the custody arrangement was decided, the person who had to leave would do so within two weeks. Also, I agreed to have my attorney threaten the pay porn site with a lawsuit if they did not remove her recordings and refund the money to them. A fact, this required no work at all. The Jezebel handled everything in one call. Allison and I were actually polite to each other while we waited for the hearing. I never sought to influence the children, and to the best of my knowledge, neither did she. And we never made nasty or caustic remarks to one other, even in private. The only terrible thing she did was wander about the home topless, whether the children were asleep or not. There. I knew why she was doing it, but in frustration I asked her once, Anyway, I want you to take one last look at what you're giving up. I was terrified on the day of the hearing, despite the fact that I knew I had the upper hand and that the worst-case scenario would be shared custody. However, I was almost frantic because I desperately wanted exclusive custody. The hearing proceeded quite smoothly, albeit shortly before the judge began interviewing the children. He made some remarks that made my stomach drop. He appeared to be leaning toward joint custody before interviewing the youngsters. He threw us a curve. I notice you've agreed to watch my interviews with the children via closed-circuit TV, the mediator stated. I'm sorry, but I cannot agree to it. I regret for not noticing this until only a few minutes ago, but it would undermine the necessary candor and trust with the children. If either of you cannot agree to my meeting with each child in private, I will have to refund your money and recommend another mediator, as the children's interviews were scheduled for tomorrow, a day off from school. Please let me know. By that point, I was almost tempted to say no, hoping that we could find another mediator who was less inclined toward joint custody than this one appeared to be. My attorney persuaded me out of it, especially since she was aware of Amber's animosity toward Allison and how, in his previous experience as a judge, the mediator listened to the children's requests. Amber was only a year away from having the authority to make her own decision under state law and the court was more likely to listen to her than any other mediator. We would. Before Allison and I went for home, we met with our attorneys and agreed on the mediator stipulation. We also promised not to question the youngsters afterward about what they said. That night at supper, Allison made certain comments that I anticipated the kids would pick up on, including her desire for joint custody. I simply gave her a stern look and said nothing. Amber caught my glance and gave me a cheeky smile. The next day, the mediator met with each of the children in private. Jerry's interview lasted barely approximately 20 minutes. Witness took around 30 minutes and Amber took more over an hour. When she was certain Allison and her attorney were not watching, she gave me a thumbs up for our agreement. Allison's parents took the kids out to eat following their interviews, with orders to drop them off at our house, approximately 4 p.m. After we had lunch, the mediator was prepared to make a decision. We did not expect him to have another week under the contract to make a decision, thus there was no responsibility to do so. He did not even want to hear the attorney's 30-minute closing arguments. After analyzing all of the facts available to me and weighing the children's best interests, I give Brian Banks exclusive custody of all three children. I further believe that, given the circumstances, the contract entered upon by the parties before the case was filed to me is reasonable and in the best interests of the children. As a result, the matter will be settled on those same terms. On Monday, I will send you with a certified copy of the summary decision to submit to family court along with your settlement. Thank you for entrusting me with this situation, and best wishes in the future.
Allison and I sobbed for different reasons. The drive home was dismal. I was in no mood to brag, and she was depressed. My old adversary, the veil of grief, had settled upon me once more at the finality of our family's divorce, even if it was on the best possible terms for me given that a breakup was required. Allison was spaced off that night, so I had to tell the kids. Most of the talking. Jerry and Whitney were both unhappy and truly hugged Allison, giving her a cursory hug. I just said wonderful things about Allison and described the visitation process. I bought another house for Allison less than a week after the hearing, and she moved in within the two-week deadline. We had agreed on the children, and I assisted her, as did her parents and brother, and we hired a moving company to transport the large goods she was taking from our home, including the king-sized bed from the master bedroom, when the divorce was finalized. A few months later, I had a victory party at my house to thank everyone who had supported me, and aside from my closest friends and parents, I didn't tell the kids what the party was about, only that it was a general celebration. Amber, who was now 13, had figured it out just as the visitors were about to arrive, and I was making last-minute preparations in the den. She entered and closed the door. She made me sit down and then sat on my lap. Daddy, how pleased are you that the custody arrangement turned out as it did? Even she found the question sophisticated. While I'm extremely thrilled. Amber, why are you asking? I responded. She broke out in a huge grin. I knew it would work out. When I spoke with the mediator, I told him that I had witnessed Mom and that Mayberry guy having sex in our home. When I returned home for one day, it had a negative impact on me. Have you seen them? Was my astonished response. What difference does it really make? She was cheating. I would have refused to accompany her if she had been awarded custody of me, and I knew it was better for Jerry and Whitney to remain with us. I just thought you'd want to know, she said with a wide grin. She kissed my cheek, climbed from my lap, and left. I chose not to pursue the matter further. What I did pursue, beginning with the victory celebration, was Jezebel. Jezebel arrived to the party looking like a millionaire. She instantly connected with Jerry and Whitney. For about a half hour, she and Jerry played catch and pepper, a bunting and fielding game for baseball players. She was far better at it than I ever was. Jezebel sat down one-on-one -on -one with Whitney. I'm not sure what they talked about, but they were speaking and laughing for about an hour. Amber was more shy regarding Jezebel than the other two youngsters, but she appeared to have a nice reaction to her, and they discussed fashion. Jezebel included me in our family's courtship. Halfway through the party, she secluded me in the den, grabbed me, and said, You no longer have an excuse to not let me screw your brains out. Have your parents look after the kids tonight and come home with me. I swear you will be alive when I let you return at 10 a.m. tomorrow. However, I cannot guarantee that you will be coherent. When she saw the sight in my eyes, she didn't wait for a vocal response instead planting a lecherous kiss on my lips before swinging her bombs exaggeratedly as she walked out of the den. That night, Jezebel nearly drove me insane. As I was leaving, I told Jezebel, I'm not sure what you see in me, but God damn it, I love being with you. Do we have a shot at a meaningful relationship? She gazed at her lips as she stared into my eyes. I regard you as a kind, generous, and intelligent person. Why don't you take me to a resort for three days on the weekend of the 14th to see if we both want to be in a serious relationship? To be honest, I'm tired of messing around. I want a man who is only mine. She kissed me again before closing the door and adding, Get home to those beautiful kids. Two years have passed since my victory party and my life has changed significantly. All three children are well-adjusted, joyful and prospering in their academic, social, and extracurricular interests. Allison has done nothing wrong and has fully exercised her visitation privileges without abusing them. Amber's relationship with mom has improved significantly since we were a family. Amber even went with her and the other two kids to Allison's parents' lake house for ten days last summer and returned with no negative comments. My business is prospering and I'm earning more than ever. My ownership of the operational companies was accidentally revealed, however, when a report we submitted with the government was delivered to a number of employees who we did not plan to get it. Even that has worked out, and no one has treated me differently than before.
Roger Mayberry left town shortly after the victory party and, according to the lone employee who has maintained touch with him, is working as an entry-level sales representative for an electronics company on the West Coast that does not deal with sensitive technology. The kids have more than accepted Jezebel. All three regard her as a friend rather than a mother figure, and they thoroughly enjoy her presence. After two years, Jezebel decided that we should be exclusive. Last month, she sold her pornographic website and moved in with the kids and me. Although she does not want to marry, she simply wants me and wants to be a friend and mother to the children while still running a small specialty apparel internet sales company. I hope you enjoy that story. Here is another one. It began off so innocently. My wife and I were shopping down Michigan Avenue. Jane was looking for a new costume for our forthcoming 25th birthday celebration. She had found a lovely dress and two sets of shoes to match, but couldn't decide which to wear. So I suggested we stop by Gibson's for a drink and get our daughter-in-law's opinion. Jane agreed. After a two-hour shopping trip, she was ready for a drink, and it would be wonderful to surprise Taylor, who we hadn't seen in a while. We figured Taylor, our sister-in-law, would be working today because she generally takes the Saturday shift. She indicated that tipping on Saturday was always preferable. Our son Paul was out of town last week. He was gathering testimony and information for a court case he is working on. Paul works for the district attorney's office, and while he was not allowed to go into detail, he intimated that the case is tied to the Russian mafia, and he has spoken with several former members who were in the Federal Witness Protection Program. Jane and I took a cab for the short trek to Rush Street. It was only six blocks away, but Jane's legs were twitching. Jane only has to wear 10-inch heels when she shops on Michigan Avenue. Something about appearing proper. I've been married long enough to know that I should keep my mouth shut and not point out the lack of logic in her shoe choices. The taxi dropped us in front of the restaurant. Taylor's shift must have been at its slowest about midday. Hopefully, we'll be able to converse for a few minutes while enjoying beverages and nibbles. When I opened the restaurant door for Jane, I noticed Taylor in the rear of the bar. She was difficult to overlook because she was 75 cm of Scandinavian beauty. Taylor was conversing with another waiter, but there was something intimate about their stance that raised my suspicions, especially Taylor's hand lying on the waiter's shoulder. We stood there for a full minute because the maitre d' was not at the entrance when we arrived. During that minute, I focused on Taylor. I was shocked by the way they looked at each other. I looked to Jane to see whether she had a similar reaction. I requested the maitre d' for a table in Taylor's section, and after Taylor left, I finally looked away from the other server. As she approached our table, she noticed her attractive waitress smile, which faded as soon as she recognized us and was replaced with a look of shock and anxiety. Mom and Dad, what a surprise. Taylor's voice sounded strained, and she was obviously trying to grin again. Jane answered her. Taylor, we stopped over for a drink and to ask your thoughts on some sneakers. We've been shopping for several hours and both need a drink. As usual, you, Dad, are Basil, Hayden, Neat, and Mom is a gray goose. Rocks. That will be wonderful. Please add one of those cheese dishes. There is no haste, Taylor. How did you spend the week when Paul was away? I asked. I've been really busy and extremely lonely. I miss Paul and hope he gets home soon. Work has been okay. I am training Carlo, the new waiter. Taylor stared at Carlo when she stated this, much to her disappointment. Carlo winked, noting her expression. Taylor hurried away, saying, I'll get you some drinks, and most likely telling Carlo to relax in front of her husband's relatives. Carlo gave us a short glance before heading for the kitchen. I took advantage of Taylor's absence and asked Jane, Babe, I realize my past makes me skeptical. So, Mark, tell me what you saw there. You are suspicious for a cause. I noticed the same thing you did, and I'm not going to allow Taylor to shatter our son's heart. She was a touch anxious and she seemed overly comfortable with the new guy. Do you think I should call your uncle Teddy? Teddy was Jane's uncle, who retired from the Chicago Police Department a few years ago and now works in the security industry, Jane's family on her father's side. Summers were spent with police officers, and Simon Kelly on her mother's side was linked to the Sicilian Mafia. This made for some strange family gatherings. Yeah, why not phone my uncle and ask for a drink? Taylor returned with our drinks and sat with us for a bit, as there were just a few other customers. When Carlo arrived at the table to bring our appetizer, I seized the chance to introduce myself and speak with him briefly. 
It was clear that Carlos's first tongue was not English. It took me a few questions before I realized he was from Italy and had worked here while studying at Loyola. Jane and I completed our beverages and the majority of the cheese before returning home, where I contacted Uncle Teddy, Mark Davis's story. You could think I'm paranoid. Why do I have the disagreeable sense that two co-workers are conversing during a workday break? It has to do with how my previous marriage ended. Marriage with Paul's birth mother. Her name was Claire. Probably still is. If she still lives. We hadn't spoken for 15 years. Not since she attended Paul's high school graduation. I married Claire right out of college. She was the bartender at the tavern where we hung out. She was the most attractive, well-built woman I had ever encountered. And, as a wonderful illustration of thinking with my small brain, I began dating her as soon as she expressed interest in me. I'm not a horrible guy, but I'm sure her interest to me stemmed from the fact that I was a graduate student in college, and she was probably aware of my trust fund. I usually had a wad of cash with me, and I always tipped bartenders, particularly the gorgeous ones, more than the standard amount. Claire accepted to our date. Fucked me half to death on our first night together and agreed to my proposal for the rest of the semester. My parents tried to talk me out of marrying her, but I was far more intelligent than they were. I believe Mark Twain stated that he was shocked by how much his own father had learnt in the seven years between Twain's 18th and 25th birthdays. Whoever said it and whatever he said pertained to me during those years. Fortunately, my grandfather took extremely particular steps while establishing trust money for my brother and me. They included denying us access to the funds until we reached our 30th birthdays and necessitating a prenuptial agreement prior to any marriage, even if we did not have half a million in trust funds. I was still quite affluent as long as I maintained decent marks. My parents gave me a generous stipend, and because to their connections I had a terrific job waiting for me after I graduated with an MBA. I graduated. Claire signed a prenuptial agreement. I'm very sure she was high when she signed it, but the notary didn't seem to notice because he was too busy looking under Claire's top for her bare breasts. And we married in Vegas at my parents' house, despite modest concerns. I'm not going to say the entire marriage was bad. In fact, if Jane sees this, I'd say the sex was enjoyable, even though Claire and I have had sex since our first date. During that week in Vegas, she was at her peak performance. Claire spent every day in the water, topless and wearing the smallest bikini she could find. In fact, one afternoon she encountered a young flight attendant who lent her a wicked weasel bikini she had purchased in the Caribbean. I was reclining on my poolside lounger when the two of them emerged from Beth's room. Claire removed her disguise and I almost choked on my beer. She was wearing only a little pair of panties with a string in the back. Will we be kicked out of here? I asked. If someone complains, I'll put another one on she responded. No one complained, but Claire and Beth spent the day and the following giggling at all the males who found excuses to pass by, displaying their boners beneath their suits. Claire continued to be an exhibitionist in the evening. She wore either her tightest jeans with a provocative top, never with a bra underneath, or some variation of a little black dress that barely covered her ass and breasts. One night, she emerged from the bedroom dressed in an almost obscene red silk dress completed by a pair of red stiletto shoes high enough for her to look directly into my eyes. Claire was 170 cm tall, while I am 180 cm. Where are we going when you're dressed like that? I asked. As we proceeded past the foyer, she just said, You'll see. I enjoyed watching men and a few ladies turn their attention as Claire passed by. We got in a taxi. Claire handed the cabbie a note, and we set off into the Vegas nightlife. We paused in front of a strip club. Claire got out of the cab as I paid the driver. He smiled, thanked me for the excellent tip, and wished me a happy time. Prior to that night, I had only visited a few strip clubs in the Midwest. The girls usually looked between five and eight points. Only a few of them danced with genuine ASM enthusiasm, and they were always wearing a thong to conceal their dignity. Vegas was different. Where did all of these stunning women originate from? Sure, some, if not all of them, could have been improved, but even so, the operation was excellent. Claire grinned warmly at me as I looked up at the stage and noticed two absolutely naked beauties swinging from a pole like this. She asked. Claire lifted up the skirt of her dress, revealing a garter around her upper thighs. She pulled a couple hundred dollar dollars from below her garter. 
Tonight is my special treat for you. She treated me the same way. I did three lap dances that night. I tried all of my willpower to avoid groping each dancer's breasts or ass with my hands. Two large bouncers who appear to belong on the defensive line provide a solid deterrent. As difficult as my private dances were, I nearly ended up in my pants after Claire purchased a private dance for herself. Either the bouncers weren't paying attention, or they gave the ladies a bit more freedom after Claire kissed the dancers' breasts twice. After Claire's private dance, we returned to the hotel. I intended to head up to our room right away, but Claire requested another drink. We sat in the living room, and Claire did her best to keep taunting us. What did you like tonight? She murmured into my ear. You mean, aside my stunning wife in the tightest dress I've ever seen? Or two naked women whirling on poles with the grace of ballerinas? Or maybe I just enjoyed watching you lap dance and get away with kissing her breasts. I performed better than that. With those words, Claire rubbed her middle finger beneath my nose. It smelled like sex. I bet you $100 she had sex with someone within the last several hours. Damn it, Claire! How long will you tease me here? I want to! What I don't get is how you can stand it. Don't you want to be laid after all this teasing? Who says I haven't been had? Claire stated this while staring me directly in the eyes and playing with the top of my thigh. Remember when I went to the bathroom when you were performing the third private dance? Did you ever wonder why I was away so long? Or did you simply like that brunette so much that you didn't miss me? What are you saying? I'm saying my husband was having so much fun with the brunette that he didn't notice his wife was gone long enough to have sex in the men's room with the attractive black gentleman sitting at the adjacent table. I was having trouble processing Claire's admissions. Had she continued to taunt me, or had she truly slept with another guy and given me the horns just four days after our wedding? Oh, poor Mark. Your expression tells me you want it to be a lie. If you ever cheat on me, I will divorce you so quickly that you will feel dizzy. Now let's head upstairs. If you sleep with someone, this marriage ends before it ever begins. In Vegas, divorce is virtually as easy as getting married. Claire was horrified, but she didn't resist when I grabbed her hand and almost dragged her to the elevator and back down the corridor to our room. She probably had three or four finishers before I allowed my emotions take over for the second time. We rested in one other's arms. With one hand, I played with her golden hair, the other with her ass. It had been a wonderful night but I felt I had one more thing to say before we fell asleep. I'll take the taunting, but remember what I said. If I ever catch you cheating, our relationship will be finished. I understand it's not the most romantic thing a husband can say to his wife after making love, but Claire needed to know how I felt about adultery. We most likely conceived Paul that night, or during one of our week's mornings, afternoons, or evenings in Vegas, because six weeks later Claire was holding one of those pregnancy test strips, which was positive. I was overjoyed to be having a baby, and Claire looked pleased as well. At least she never said anything nasty. We were financially secure because of my income. We agreed Claire might be a stay-at-home mom. Claire's pregnancy was uneventful. Paul was born in December, and he was undoubtedly my son. Claire wasn't a terrific mother, but she was a nice one to Paul. One of our main debates in the latter stages of Claire's pregnancy was whether Paul would breastfeed. Claire flatly refused to discuss the topic. And after all, a woman cannot be forced to breastfeed her child. Claire wanted to return to work after Paul reached his second birthday. Her only profession was bartending. As a compromise, I requested no diner or lounge. She needed to locate an elegant restaurant to work in, otherwise it would be impossible. Claire complied with my demands and was hired three months later at one of the nicest lunch clubs in town. My mother and Claire's mother watched Paul for a few hours when our work schedules coincided. I believed we had a good marriage. I genuinely liked Claire and assumed she felt the same way. There were no evident problems after Claire began working. We started spending less time together, but I felt it would be temporary until Claire became pregnant again. Unfortunately, there was a snake hidden in the grass named Neil. Claire and Neil worked together in the restaurant. I met him a couple of times while sitting at the bar, which I did occasionally to spend some additional time with my wife. I had never noticed anything between them that would have alerted me, so the fateful day when I stepped into our house came as a surprise. The house was spotless, and the kitchen smelled like my favorite cuisine. I kissed Claire and gave Paul a high five. 
What have I done to deserve this? I asked. Claire's response was like a fist to my chest. Mark, this is difficult to say, but I'm leaving tonight with Neil. We're heading to California. Neil has a role in a television show and he wants me to join him. I'm not sure, but I guess I sat there for a few minutes, changing my glance from Claire to Paul and back again. I eventually shook the cobwebs from my head. You aren't taking Paul? God, no. Paul is staying with you. He is better off here with you and our parents. I can't take care of him while I'm working there, and Neil has no desire to be a parent. I couldn't take it anymore and began yelling, You fucking bitch, how can you do this to us? How could you forsake me and your son? What the heck did I do to earn this shit? You did nothing, Mark. But the first time Neil penetrated me, I knew it was over. You've always stated you'd divorce my ass if I had ever cheated on you. At that point, I realized that our almost three-year-old boy had been exposed to some of the most offensive words coming from his parents' mouths. Paul sat at the table, terrified. I took him up and seated him in front of the television. I turned on a Disney movie with the volume turned up, kissed him on the top of his head, and returned to the kitchen. Claire did not move. What's so special about this idiot that you have to abandon your family? Do not ask Mark. You do not want to know. I had the self-control to refrain from screaming. No, I truly do want to know. You never seem disappointed by our lovemaking. You've never complained. What is his secret strategy for snatching wives from their husbands? It turns out I shouldn't have asked because her response triggered my visions for months thereafter. Let us just say, yeah, Mark, you're rather huge down there. But Neil is a monster, and I'm beginning to like it. So that's it? Are you leaving us for this? Hell, I'll buy you one of those brand new huge mimics for lovers and you can stay here to raise your son. Mark, this isn't going anywhere. I withdrew half of the money from our accounts and have two packed suitcases in my car. I won't need my winter clothes in L.A., therefore I'll donate them to charity. I'll let you know where I arrive in Los Angeles. However, you still have my cell phone number in case of an emergency. I was still stunned and didn't grab the rock from her left hand as she stepped into the TV room. She hugged and kissed Paul before simply walking out the door. The next day, I woke up my groggy brain and started separating our lives, canceled credit cards, canceled joint accounts, and contacted a lawyer to begin divorce proceedings, all the usual rubbish. Claire was in L.A. with Mr. Big. Months later, my recuperation stalled slightly when I spotted the asshole one night while channel surfing. I was curious about Claire's reaction to Neil's character being in bed with a beautiful actress and simulating sex. I didn't handle it very well. I stopped watching the channel because, well, two people were in bed together, and I hadn't had sex for months. Then I noticed Neil was a man in bed. And to top it all off, he was in bed with a blonde actress who could have been Claire's twin. Talk about poor timing. I turned off the television, poured three fingers of bourbon, and sent thoughts of bad karma west to Los Angeles. I also enrolled Paul in childcare so he could attend during my working hours. Claire's mom offered to watch Paul for free, but I declined out of spite. I let her parents take Paul out for day outings on weekends, but never let him stay overnight. You can call me petty, but they reared Claire, and I somehow justified my actions based on her treachery. My parents didn't come right out and say, I told you so. But they took a strange delight in what transpired next. It appears that Dad, in order to safeguard his grandson, hired a private investigator in Los Angeles to monitor Claire and Neil. We discovered that they used cocaine on a regular basis. He also recorded their sex parties. Claire didn't mind sharing, and Neil didn't seem to care either. The private investigator ensured that the pair was arrested for drugs. It was merely a misdemeanor, but Claire's conviction and sex party images would present her as an unsuitable mother if she ever changed her mind and attempted to reclaim Paul. In Paul's kindergarten class, I met Jane, my second wife. Jane, a teacher at the school, developed a special interest in Paul. As you might anticipate, Paul struggled to cope to his divorce and impending separation from his mother. Jane's tolerance and wisdom helped Paul get past his emotional reaction to her leaving. I came to know Jane during our weekly half-hour conference call to discuss Paul's development. Naturally, as the weeks went, Jane and I began chatting about ourselves. Jane began asking me questions to determine how I was handling Paul's concerns. One afternoon, I exchanged places and simply inquired, How about you, Miss Summers? What are you drawn to? Jane briefly explained what had transpired. 
As a teenager, she acquired a tumor that required surgery, rendering her infertile. After graduating from high school, she seriously explored becoming a nun and spent six months as a novice before going home to attend college with the goal of becoming an elementary school teacher. She changed her mind in the midst of her freshman year and decided to specialize in early childhood teaching, where she has worked for the past six years. I decided to go all in. How about your personal life? Are there any serious boyfriends? Jane gazed at me and said nothing, as if she was debating how to react to my invasion of her privacy. Oh, I thought to myself. This is where she informs me she is a lesbian or simply dislikes guys. Jane grinned instead. I dated but never entered into long-term meaningful partnerships. There was one man in college who really wanted to have children, so that became the emphasis of the relationship. I felt encouraged. Could I take you out to supper sometime? It would be good to know you better, and thanks for what you've done for Paul. Seeing Paul smile and laugh is enough of a reward. However, if you want to eat supper together, the answer is yes. That Friday night dinner sparked a fantastic relationship, which blossomed into a lovely romance. Paul adored Jane. My parents adored Jane. I adored Jane, but she adored Paul and me even more. We got married within a year. Maybe eventually I'll write about our romance and marriage. But if I do, you can find it in the romance area. Over the next few years, we heard less and less from Claire, until I finally asked whether Jane could adopt Paul. I flew out to Los Angeles with the documentation to discuss it face to face. It was the first time we had truly talked since the night she departed, and I took advantage of the opportunity to ask some questions. Tell me why. Claire, I can't believe you left for the reasons you stated that night. No, and I'm sorry I hurt you in that way. We got married too young, Mark. At least I was too young. You know, I was insane when we met, and I expected our love to alter me, but it didn't. And then I had a baby while still battling with the concept of forever. It was just too much. I assumed that going to work would allow me to interact with adults. But Neil showed up, and I screwed up by allowing him to blow dust into my eyes. I didn't say anything as Claire spoke, but she could see the pain in my eyes. You should not feel sad, Mark. You and Paul will do better without me. You're considerably better off with Jane in your life. Claire and I talked for another half hour. She signed the authorization to adopt Paul, and I kissed her farewell. I still don't understand how a mother can let go of her child. I believe the medicines contributed significantly to her downward spiral. However, we were all taken aback by Claire's collapse when she arrived at Paul's high school graduation after Neil had already left. By then, Claire was joined by a man who made Iggy Pop look good. Claire was confronted with the skeleton of her former self. I felt horrible for Paul, and particularly for Claire's parents. It must be heartbreaking to watch your daughter deteriorate. Once again, Jane's love and attention helped Paul get through this nightmare. I must admit that I have asked God why he did not let a woman like Jane to have her own children, whether or not God responded. I've realized that Jane not only nurtured Paul to be the fine young man he is now, but that Mrs. Davis's preschool programs have benefited hundreds of other children. Ted Summers and Vincent Simon Shelley are two terrific men to know. Uncle Teddy didn't waste any time. Teddy knocked on our front door early Thursday morning exactly a week after my Saturday evening call. He sat across from Jane and me. I handed him a beer while holding my breath. Teddy began. Well, let me start with the positive news. Taylor did not do anything with Carlo Balzano. I let the air out of my chest. Jane squeezed my hand simultaneously. I believe it is time to intervene. There was some flirting between them, and Carlo is a professional charmer. We couldn't legally tap Taylor's phone, but my buddies at the police department obtained a court order to wiretap Carlo based on his contacts with some problematic persons who are already under surveillance. He called her several times this week. He pretended to seek her for advice regarding her acquaintance. Taylor was nice on the phone and offered him advice on how to handle his relationship, which, by the way, does not exist. But Taylor declined all of his offers to meet outside of work. So this is the awful news. The Russian mob attempted to extract something from Paul but discovered no dirty laundry, so they're attempting to approach the situation from a different perspective. Apparently, the Russians learned that Paul's mother, Claire, had become a bad woman. They utilize Carlo, who has an ugly reputation as a first-class gigolo to spread the word about Taylor. Then they'll either blackmail Paul or feel it will make him weak. 
when he discovers that his wife has become as much of a bad woman as his mother, you have got to be kidding me. They believe this is going to work. My sources indicate there is an Interpol report that explains how it worked. Previously, a prosecutor in Europe became enraged when given photos of his wife sleeping with multiple men at once. The man went insane and walked into a small Russian social club brandishing a gun. He fired a few shots before being subdued. A few persons were injured. No one perished, but the investigation was halted, and the entire matter was kept quiet. I know that sounds too crazy to be true, but remember the old adage about facts being stranger than fiction? Anyway, here's what my cop friends told me. The Russians appear to believe they can duplicate their scenario here. Okay, assuming that's what's going on, what should we do first? Call Taylor and explain what's going on with Carlo. Second, get rid of Carlo, who is undoubtedly yearning for Paul to return home next week. Therefore, yet, he has not committed a crime, therefore the police cannot become involved. And, as a retired police officer, I cannot be engaged in his disappearance or risk losing my pension. Or perhaps worse. Jane, call your mother's brother. Vin, this is his case. Teddy suggested that Jane's uncle Vincent handle Carlo. That got me wondering, Uncle Ted. What if Carlos was tied to the Sicilians? Are the Sicilians and Russians working together? It is not going to happen, Mark. These guys despise each other. Carlo is a freelance gigolo. When the Russians hired him, he had to be aware that he was taking risks. If Vin gets rid of him, the town will have one less piece of shit. Ted finished his beer, rose up, kissed his niece on the cheek, and walked out the door, wishing her good luck. Please let me know when it is over. It was time to act quickly. It was Thursday, and Paul was scheduled to return the following Tuesday or Wednesday, so it seemed sensible for Carlo to complete his performance that weekend before Paul arrived. I called Vincent to see if we could stop by right immediately. Jane called Taylor and invited her to come over tonight. Jane and I had never asked Uncle Vin for a favor before. I knew he adored his niece, but Dad and I had never been particularly close. Did he like my son? who wasn't a blood relative but could help with the problem? So what about the Russians? Could Vincent's involvement have resulted in a gang war? The wedding day scene from The Godfather? And those questions raced through my mind as we sat in his office, telling him what we had learned from Ted. Okay, tell Taylor to accept Carlo's offer to meet. I am expecting he will try to meet Saturday night after work. He will pour her a few drinks and if necessary, sneak a date-rape drug into her drink before taking advantage of the scenario. Carlo, I know this. He came to us asking for work, but we turned him down due to his reputation. It doesn't surprise me that the Russian mafia apprehended him. Hard cases show little regard for respectable ladies. I had to ask, will this generate problems between you and the Russians? No. That is why they are utilizing an outsider. They believe we are too foolish to connect the links between them. Carlo and my grandnephew. When Vincent mentioned grandnephew, my eyes widened and he observed the expression on my face. Mark, I know we haven't talked about this. You married my niece, the loveliest girl I know. If I were lucky enough to have a daughter, I would hope she grew up to be as lovely inside and out as Jane. I looked at Jane and she flushed. Vincent went on, and I prayed that she would be fortunate enough to discover the love that Jane did with you and your baby. I pay attention to these things. I know you two have something few couples have, and I appreciate you sharing it with my niece. Go home, speak with Taylor, and tell her to go out with that idiot Saturday night after work. Nothing will happen to Taylor. I guarantee it. With those remarks, Uncle Vincent rose up, shook my hand, and hugged Jane, kissing the top of her head. Without a doubt, both uncles adored her like she was their own daughter, as difficult as it was to seek Uncle Vincent for help. The toughest phase was still to come. Taylor was meant to arrive that evening. She appeared more calm than the previous Saturday afternoon. When we answered the door, she kissed us both before sitting down to eat. I hoped that was a good indication. Jane took the lead. Taylor, it's difficult to say this, but what we witnessed on Saturday disturbed both Mark and myself. Is there anything going on between you and this Carlo guy? Taylor reacted angrily to Jane's inquiry. Mom, how could you think like that? Please, Taylor, I never insulted your intelligence. Don't offend me. Even though there was no visible physical intimacy, you two clearly had a moment. When Mark and I walked into the restaurant, 
you were too excited to claim perfect innocence, and even if you didn't think you were having an emotional affair, Carlo clearly did. When Jane finished, Taylor sobbed. I am sorry, Mama. I am sorry, Dad. Nothing happened other than some casual flirtation. I felt humiliated about what you saw on Saturday. I would never injure Paul. Carlo tried to convince me to go out with him, but I kept declining. I admit that during working hours, I allowed him to be more flirty than I should have. He has a way of making things appear harmless. But please believe me when I say that we never had any physical intimacy, and I never made him believe that we could be more than simply nice co-workers. Now it was my turn, considering how agitated Taylor was. I have to be cautious with the following stage of this intervention. Hold on to your hat, young lady. You haven't heard everything yet. I proceeded to tell Taylor about the Russians, Carlo's true intentions as a gigolo, the incident in Europe, and how she fit into the tale. If I hadn't spoken with Jane's uncles directly, I would have had trouble believing it, so I wasn't surprised when Taylor inquired if we were making it all up to scare the crap out of her. Jane, call Uncle Ted and allow Taylor to hear it for herself. We watched Taylor becoming increasingly furious as Ted confirmed what we told her. When she hung up, I gave her a drink of brandy. Taylor took a big swallow from the glass and his expression improved slightly. What do I do now? Should I quit my job? I answered her. No, but what we are about to ask of you may be very difficult. First and foremost, I apologize for asking this question. Do you swear that nothing occurred between you and Carlo? I apologize, but everything hinges on your response. Taylor answered with tears in her eyes. Please believe me, Father. I've never had anyone other than your kid since we professed our love to each other and became exclusive. If I were that type of lady, I would not have married Paul. I understand how hurt he was when his birth mother abandoned the two of you. And I couldn't profess to love a man while doing it to him. I want what you and my parents have, a lifetime partnership with your other half. And for me, that's Paul Taylor. That means a lot to me. With that said, if you agree, here's what you need to do. We've hired a few of private investigators to monitor you over the next few days. We expect Carlo will invite you to meet him for a drink before Paul returns home. Most certainly, after work on Saturday night. Accept the invitation to this. Taylor began shaking her head. No, and they looked at me as if I had lost my mind. It's okay, Taylor. Make sure the meeting spot is highly packed. There are no apartments in other private communities. Before you take your first sip, detectives will have arrived in the neighborhood. Detectives will intercede. I didn't inform Taylor that the detectives were related to Uncle Vincent. If she suspected, she had the foresight to leave it at that. When the detectives arrived, one of them would get you into a cab and escort you right here. I also didn't inform Taylor that there wasn't a driver in the taxi. It was another of Vincent's staff. We did not want to take any chances, as expected. Carlo called Taylor on Friday and asked if she wanted to get a drink with him after work on Saturday. He told it plainly, claiming he needed her feminine wisdom, after getting dumped. He acted as if his heart would shatter if he couldn't share his anguish with Taylor, whom he admired and respected. Being Italian, he wanted to know why American ladies didn't think he was worthy or handsome. Taylor attempted to sound empathetic and agreed to join him for a drink on Saturday. Taylor arrived to work late on Saturday skipping the first half of her shift. She informed us she couldn't tolerate working alongside Carlo for an entire 10-hour shift. Taylor's taxi came onto the driveway around 11 p.m. She stepped through the door, sat down on the couch, and cried on Jane's shoulder. Thankfully, the trauma had ended. Epilogue. Sunday afternoon, we went to dinner at Jane's parents' house. I wasn't surprised when Uncle Vin arrived. I smelled lasagna and garlic bread in the oven and noticed two bottles of Sicilian red on the table. After dinner, he asked Jane and me to the back porch, where Uncle Vin smoked a cigar and we all drank Strega. He said he'd taken care of everything. After Taylor left, two of Uncle Vin's goons allegedly persuaded Carlo to leave the bar. I believe the pistols and threats were part of the convincing, as none of the other bar patrons paid attention. Carlo was discovered in possession of a date, rape, drug, and ecstasy. Carlo was transported to a storage container where he sang like a bird while being recorded. Carlo revealed everything, including where he planned to take Taylor after drugging her Uncle Vin's. Two more males went to the hotel room and discovered the three miscreants waiting for Carlo and Taylor. Two cameras on tripods were prepared for the event. Taylor was extremely lucky that night. 
The three men in the hotel were discovered the following day with gags in their mouths and tied to chairs. All of them would survive, but they would be unable to use their fingers and toes for several months and would require substantial rehabilitation. Carlo would never be discovered. Taylor stayed with us till Paul arrived home on Wednesday. It was an emotional evening. Paul was told everything except Uncle Vincent's involvement in Carlo's disappearance. Paul is a litigator and some information cannot be revealed. We contended that Carlo must have fled town to avoid the Russians' anger after failing to seduce Taylor. We know Paul is too smart to believe it, but he also understands when not to raise questions. Taylor held her breath as she told Paul about her flirtation with Carlo. Regardless matter how benign it was, the situation changed dramatically when Paul mentioned that if every couple divorced because of a business disagreement, there would be few marriages remaining. In fact, he said that he and Sandra Miller, another attorney in the office, had flirted on occasion. We all laughed as Taylor responded to his confession. Tell that bitch to keep away from my hubby. Taylor blushed immediately upon realizing what she had said. Paul informed his supervisor about the conspiracy. And let's just say that it didn't help the Russians' case one bit. It appears that the Russians were also attempting to ambush a female lawyer working on the case in Paul's office. When she learned about Carlo and Taylor, she connected the dots. The young man she had just started dating was attempting to get her involved in a local swingers club. It was too much of a coincidence, and she dumped the guy instantly. The Russians faced the full force of federal, state, and local law enforcement. All of Paul's co-workers had just a faint understanding of what the Russians had planned for the two of them. And if that wasn't enough, it appears that a Sicilian acquaintance of ours sent word that if his nephew or his nephew's wife were ever in danger, all bets were off. At our 25th anniversary celebration, I noticed Teddy and Vincent conversing in the corner. I didn't bother them, but I wished I had been a part of that talk. Taylor soon resigned her job. She dedicated her time to preparing the children and assisting at the daycare center. We were startled to learn she was pregnant twins. The twins were born last month, and they are undeniably my son's babies.